Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to stand for a little bit because I just can't sit and talk too much. I'm a little bit too animated sometimes. Uh, please interrupt me as questions arise. Uh, I don't want to be all formal and luxury about this. So, um, just to sort of motivate the demo or discussion of interest today. First off, um, you can look at uh, types in programming as being a tool that we have to sort of classify programs, right? And we have sort of three regions here. We have the well-typed programs, that is, those programs which pass the type checker. And we have our good programs. And so many, many good programs pass the type checker, and that's great. Uh, sometimes we also have some bad programs that pass the type checker, right? Like We wanted to rule them out, but we can't rule every bad program out, because that's just impossible. Um, and then an advance in uh, type systems, an advance in programming languages is one that perhaps decreases the number of bad programs that type check. Um, right? So, but, you know, we also have this sort of nasty region over here. I think Simon Payton Jones called it something along the lines of the region of unbearable agony, which are these good programs that we really want to write, but, but they're just not well typed. And another advance, advance in programming languages can sort of decrease the number of good programs that we are unable to write. So what we're getting here is sort of computation happening in our type system to enable both of these things, right? So we're wanting to rule out bad programs by enforcing non-trivial invariants, right? And, and these require sort of ever more non-trivial types. And we're getting sort of more and more expressive. We can say more about our programs. We can admit more of them. Um, and and so, so we're getting this interesting computation happening in the type checker while it's compiling your code. Um, and and Scala's type system is even terrain complete if you uh, assume that the compiler has unbounded memory, which is a common assumption when saying that something is terrain complete. So um, how, how do these look, right? So this, here's, here's some Scala for you. This, this is a lambda, believe it or not. Um, so if, you can't even write this in Haskell as far as I know. So this, this is a, a type level function that takes some type A and maps it to the type either A string. And, and you know the way you have to encode this is by defining a structural type with a type member called f, which takes one parameter and then maps to this, and then you do a type level projection to get that out. Um, so yeah, so that, that's that's lambda a um, either a string in uh, in Scala's type system. Let's say you want to do some uh, addition here. Well, we can define a trait nat, and we say that it has an abstract type member plus, which takes some type n bounded by nat and gives back some type bounded by nat. And then we can have a, a trait 0, which is extending that. And its implementation of plus maps n to n, which is to say does nothing. We can have a trait suck, which is to say the successor, or n plus 1, with this n. And if we try to say that that plus m, well, that's suck of, n, of n's plus applied to m. Um, I, I don't know how. You can also write this in other ways. I think this is the most straightforward. Um, you know, we, we can actually like write folds at the type level, all kinds of great stuff. And I, I think this is really horrible. Like, it makes me want to throw up. It's terrible. Like, it, it, if you have to do it, then you have to do it. But it's really not that fun. Much less fun than writing Scala. Uh, likewise, in Haskell, you know, we have all these extensions that we've gotten to make the type system more expressive. Like, we've got uh, GADTs, which give us some sort of indexed families. We've got type families, which allow us to write some sort of functions in the type system on types. Uh, we've got data kinds, which allow us to promote data types up to the type level and use a data type as an actual type. We've got multi-parameter type classes, fund apps, undecidable instances. We've got polymorphic kinds. We've got all this crazy stuff coming into Haskell. And if you want to understand a, Has a Haskell program, it's not enough to know Haskell. You have to know the particular dialect of Haskell created by the combination of whatever extensions are in the top of the file. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so we start thinking like we have we have our programming language, which is really nice to program in, and we have our type system, which is somewhat less nice to program in. Why do we have two languages for this? Really? Like, I mean, sort of the traditional answers are things like, well, we want a phase distinction. We want a distinction between compile time and runtime, where all the type level computation, that is the stuff after the colon, we know only happens at compile time and then it can go away. Whereas the runtime computation is happening with the stuff to the left of the colon. And that'll survive the compiler, assuming it's not erased by some other optimization pass. Um, 
Another sort of practical reason why we've traditionally had two separate languages is we want our compiler to terminate, but we don't necessarily want our programs to terminate. So, you know, if, if you, it's nice to write an infinite loop sometimes if that infinite loop is doing something. Um, we don't want our compiler to fall into an infinite loop typically because then we start wondering, like, is this complicated code going to finish type checking? And then finally, we, we really want our, our types to disappear. The, the advantage of having the distinction between the type computation language and the term computation language, or an advantage, is that we know that all the types computation is done. It won't survive to runtime and make our program slow. So it can make it a little bit easier to reason about performance. But, um, you know, all of these problems are in the process of being solved. So dependent types give you one language for compile time and runtime. They give you one language for both types and terms. And unfortunately, I couldn't take this Lord of the Rings analogy any further. But um, types can contain values, and functions can return types. And it's all just one big language. So what I'm going to talk about with you tonight are sort of an overview of dependent types, which you've just seen, and then talk about dependent pattern matching and what's called the with rule. Because pattern matching is a lot more fun with dependent types than it is without them. Uh, give a little demo of how you can use dependent types to guarantee the invariance of AVL trees. Um, then take a little break. Then talk about a design pattern called universes, which is a slightly overloaded term. Uh, then a demo in that will be an interpreter for the simply type lambda calculus, where the type system of Idris guarantees the type correctness of the interpreter, which is kind of nice. And then I'll have another little break, and then switch over into what looks a little bit more like a research talk. And I'll talk about something that I was working on largely last year, but a little bit this year, which is uh, the Idris notion of type providers, which are heavily inspired by the one in F sharp. Um, and then I'll sort of talk about what I'm not covering and point you where to go for more of it, because we can't hope to cover it all in a couple hours. OK. So what is Idris? Um, I imagine you probably have an idea if you're coming to this office to hear about it, but uh, for those who don't know, it's a pure functional programming language, which is to say that side effects like Haskell are isolated from the rest of the code. It has full dependent types. Um, there's no restrictions here. You can put any any code you can. The term any code in the terminating subset of the, of Idris can be used in a type. Uh, it compiles to C, LLVM, Java, and JavaScript, and the JavaScript version has sort of na Node and browser flavors. The syntax is very inspired by Haskell. So if you can read Haskell, you can often read a lot of Idris. There's a strict evaluation order, so it probably won't do what you think it does if you're reading it the way you read Haskell. So be a little bit careful. Uh, there's an extensible syntax, which we hope that people won't overuse, but it's necessary sometimes. Uh, there's integrated theorem proving in the style of uh, Koch, although not nearly as well developed. But we have these sort of tactic proofs if any of you have used Koch. And it's all free software. Everything's on GitHub, so you can come in, download it, play with it. Hope so. So who am I? I'm a PhD student at IT University of Copenhagen. My advisor is Peter Sestoft. I'm visiting Schammers in Gothenburg at the moment because Danish uh, PhD students have six months at another university, which is quite nice. Um, I'm really into like dependent types, domain-specific languages, and sort of programming tools in general. I think it's tons of fun. Um, I'm working on the, in general, I'm employed by this project called Actualist, where we're making a domain-specific language for actuaries. So, that, so a lot of the work I'm doing, I hope to apply to that. Uh, I, I work on Idris. I've done the type providers thing. And I'm, right now, I'm working on a lot of usability issues, um, in particular error messages. Uh, I grew up in Moscow, Idaho. But I've lived in Copenhagen since 2005. So if you're wondering why some guy named Christiansen from Copenhagen doesn't sound Danish, that's why. And if you want to see more about my stuff, check out my website, itudk slash people slash drc. OK. So that said, I'm going to sit down and show you a few demos. I got my little crib sheet here so I don't embarrass myself. Uh, OK. So uh, you begin an uh, Idris file with this line saying module and then the name of the module. Uh, this looks a lot like Haskell, except we don't write where. OK. Um, the first thing I always write is uh, default total. And what that means is that if the Idris compiler is unable to prove that my program will terminate, it complains at me and forces me to annotate it. The default is the opposite, where you have to specifically say, check this function for me. And I always forget to do that, and I always shoot myself in the foot. So this is a way to make it slightly safer. 
Okay. So the natural numbers are sort of the first data type that's remotely interesting to look at. Um, I'm, I'm putting a, an apostrophe at the end just because there's one in the standard library with this name, and we'll get all sorts of difficult to decipher error messages if we do it other way. Okay. So if you've done GADTs in Haskell, you'll recognize the syntax. I'm saying that nat prime is a type, and then that z prime is a nat prime, and that s prime takes a nat prime and gives back a nat prime. I could have also used a Haskell style data type definition written data nat prime equals z prime or s prime nat prime. Um, that's completely equivalent and it'll look more familiar to you if you've been doing Haskell, but uh, there's a lot of data types that don't fit into that syntax, so I'm just starting off with the more general one at the start. Okay. So if I want to define addition of these natural numbers, it looks very much like it would in, uh, in Haskell. Uh, so I, I give it a type, and I say that plus prime is a nat prime to a nat prime to a nat prime, which is to say it's a two-argument function. It takes two natural numbers and returns a new natural number. Um, I think it's, it's kind of boring to type a bunch of stuff by hand, so I'm going to have the compiler generate the pattern match case for me. Uh, note that the, the variable names that it picked here are kind of bad, so I'm going to fix that. The first step to do is to come up here and say uh, name nat prime n m o. And now if I ask for a uh, pattern match cause, I get something a little bit nicer. Okay. And then I can say, well, the, the way I'm going to add some numbers together, it'll look a lot like that Scala example. If the first argument is 0, then I simply return the second argument. Otherwise, I return the successor of the thing under successor in the first argument plus the second argument. So in other words, I want to pattern match on n. And then in the first right-hand side, I want to say m. And I like aligning things. And then the second case, it'll be suck prime of plus prime and m. OK. And now I can come over to my redevelop print loop here, make the font somewhat readable. How's that in the back? Good. So I can say plus prime of uh, s prime of s prime of z prime of s prime of z prime. And indeed, I get back 3 when I add 2 and 1. Wonderful. OK. So this isn't sort of the most convenient way to write numbers. I, I really don't like doing it that way. So from here on out, I'm going to use the nat type in the standard library, which looks exactly like this. Um, so I just won't use the primes. Because I, I can do a little bit more work to make it so that I could use integer literals here. So if I want to say, like, you know, the nat 4, I get back 4. Um, where this the is just a function that takes a type and then an element of that type, it's a way of putting a type annotation on something, basically. OK. So now that I've got my natural numbers, I can use them as parameters to data types. So here's the sort of classic example of dependent types that you see in all of the tutorials, um, which is a list whose type contains its length. The, for some reason, th these were called vectors back in the dawn of time, and the name stuck. Uh, don't think about vectors the way you normally do <laughs> if you want to understand what's going on. So I'm going to stick this uh, prime mark on because, once again, we have something in the standard library with this name. And, it's, yeah, and it takes a type and a nat and give me back a type. Right? Or alternatively, I can write nat to type to type. OK. Um, and then I can say that it has an empty vector, where the empty vector is of type vec prime uh, 0a. So just like in Haskell, if I leave a variable name unbound, and it starts with a lowercase letter, Idris inserts it as a kind of parameter. Right? So, so it's like if I were to say, you know, in Haskell, uh, data foo of a equals bar of a. That a there, I don't have to sort of bind anywhere. It just figures out that that's a parameter. 
Okay. And then I have cons, which takes a, an element of A and then a vect prime of N of A and gives me back a vec prime of successor of N of A. And the compiler is happy. Okay. So you can overload your constructors? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't need to do the primes on the S and the Z? For the for the nat prime? In that case, I it, w it, it would have been very inconvenient had I not, but that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so what he's getting at is that in Idris allows you to overload the names of essentially anything, and then it will attempt to use the types to figure out which version to apply, and you'll get an error message if it's unable to disambiguate them, and then you have to go and write the namespace by hand. Um, so, it, so, and you haven't seen it already, but in Idris, nil and colon colon are used as the names of the constructors of vect, of list, and all kinds of other things. Um, and actually, when you use sort of list literal syntax, it desugars into ap repeated applications of something called colon colon and something called nil, which means that if you call your constructors colon colon and nil, you can use list syntax for your data type, which can be convenient. Okay. And now I'm going to name my vectors. Um, okay. So. Let's say I want to stick some of these things together. I can say append is going to take a vect prime na and a vect prime ma, and I'm going to turn down the font size just a bit, and then return a vect prime. And what goes here? Plus mm. mn. Yeah. No, I guess n plus m na. Yeah, exactly. N plus M A, where the plus there on Nats is defined just as the one above in the standard library. Okay. So now we've 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 been a little bit uh, nice to our compiler here, and we've given it lots and lots of static information. Right? It, it can figure out quite a few things. So if I if I come over here and I ask Idris sort of this this thing on the right with the question mark, it's what we call a meta variable. So it's something that's standing for code yet to be written. And I go in and I, I ask Idris, what is, what is the type of that meta variable? And as the type of this meta variable is that in a context where n is a nat, a is a type, m is a nat, and x's and y's are respectively vect n a and vect m a, then append rhs is a vect of plus n m a. I can't do much with that yet. So I take a look there. Whoa, that was wrong. Okay. There we go. And I say, well, what what happens if we if we do a split on our first argument? And then I say, Idris, what's the type of append RHS1? Well now, take a look at what's happened here. We've got the append right hand side one has type vect prime MA which is to say our n disappeared entirely. So, so what happened was when we pattern matched on the first argument, that is x's, and we found out that it was the empty vector, we also found out something about it, the argument to the type, which is to say this uh, n here, we knew that it was 0. And we know that it's 0 because we, well, we look and we see nil goes to 0. And this, I could just as well write nil here just to make it more clear. Okay. And now, when, if we look at our meta variable, append right hand side 1, we can see that it should have type vec prime <laughs> ma, and we have something like that in the immediate context, which is y's. Right? And, and we can read that off of the type signature. So I can just say, hey, Idris, you know, I, I don't feel like typing. You're like, just, just fill it in for me. And it does. How did you do that? Uh, control C, control A. But there's, I, I don't know what the, vine, the binding is in the vim mode, but you can also type colon proof search at the REPL and have it figured out for you if you're not using any of the supported editors. Uh, we really try to design things to make lots of editor support possible. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And you used like the agda and Hancock and Emacs. 
yet so far. Yeah, we're really inspired by Agdemode for a lot of this stuff. Agdemode is best of breed. It's really, really good. Um, we're not as good as it yet, but we're working mm -hmm. on it. Okay. Then, uh, taking a look at append right-hand side 2, we can see that it's expecting something which is successor of plus NMA. And the reason it's expecting that is it's done one reduction step of the plus inside of the type. Right? So it, it normalizes things as it goes. And it doesn't and because when we when we analyzed our first argument and it became and we could see that it was cons x x's, <laughs> then we knew that the length n was actually successor of some n. And plus of successor of some n, as we can see up here, is successor of plus the argument m. And that has already happened in our type down here. Which means that there's actually only one constructor that the right hand side could be, which is cons, because that's the only constructor that has a successor here in the result type. And then we're going to need an element of the right type, and we're going to need two things of length n and m, and a recursive call. And luckily, you know, Idris can put those pieces together for us. You know, so type inference for dependent types is undecidable, but code inference works sometimes. Which is kind of fun. <laughs> okay. So let's say I'm working with lists. Um, there's this classic function of lists that I'm sure you've all seen called zip. And what zip does is it takes a list of A's and a list of B's and returns a list of pairs of A and B, where the first element is paired with the first element, the second with the second, and so forth. This, but, but what happens if the, if the lists are different length? I mean, the one in Haskell sort of bails out when it runs out of stuff in one list, and then you may be losing information. Um, another alternative is to figure out some default thing, but not every type has a reasonable default thing. And it, it's really kind of unpleasant. Really what you want is you want to know that these things are the same length, right? So what we can do is we can define a function zip, which takes a vect prime n a and a vect prime of n of b, right? The same length. And we get back the same number of pairs of a and b. So examining the type of the hole here, uh, sometimes I call it a meta variable, sometimes I call it a hole. Uh, meta variable is the thing it's actually called, but in Agda it's called a hole, and sometimes I call it the wrong thing. So bear with me. So zip right hand side, we can see should be a vect n of a, b's, and we don't see anything sort of obvious in our context that'll get us that. Well, what we can do is we can pattern match on x's. So when we come up here and, and ask for the type of right hand side 1, now we can actually see that because we knew that n was 0, then we also know that n is 0 up inside of y's, inside of the type of y's. Which means that when we ask for a pattern match on y's, we only get one case rather than two cases. Because the other case wouldn't have been type correct. Because we knew that the type contained a zero, and the other one would have given us an application of the constructor s. So, well, we need to give back something that's a vector zero of a, b, and there's only one of those. So it just can solve it for us. OK. And then likewise, in the, in the case of zip right-hand side 2, we can see that the expected type has this successor in it. Because right? we knew that the original n is now the successor of some other n up here. Um, well, great, let's pattern match y's. And we see that we only get back one case. And now Idris is smart enough to solve everything. So this is quite nice. And to sort of forestall the question that I know is coming, if I try to zip uh, y, uh, y colon colon y's with the empty list, I get back a type error. Oh. And I see that, in fact, the types do not match for the two patterns on the left-hand side, right? Because successor of n coming from our y y's is not zero coming from our empty vector. So it's ruled out something meaningless and it's also sort of taking care of this what do I do case at the end. So if there are two possible ways to fill a hole, 
Will it not try, or will it give you one of them? You'll get one of them. So you, you can't use this blindly. I mean, okay. <laughs> it's it's convenient to save typing, but you should have an idea. You should at least be able to recognize correct code when you see it. Okay. So like, if you had vec prime, if you had like a same type tuple thing that you were making, it could have given like create the tuple xx. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. So it's just arbitrary. How yeah, or, or, or to use a, maybe a more realistic example. Let's say we want to do uh, zip prime, which takes lists A to list B to list of A, B. <coughs> and then, uh, actually, sorry, append prime, which that's a better example. Okay, so if we're doing it with an append, then we can get back uh, that, and then if we ask it to give me an answer, it no. gives me y's, which is kind of cool. And if we ask for it in this case, then it gives me back y's, which is not so cool. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so it's really quite dumb. Like it, it just sort of searches backwards and then it picks things, and if they don't type check, it rolls them out and goes onward and it eventually gives up. But if too many things type check, then it becomes a less useful feature and you have to write more code yourself. So there's sort of a balance here between how much work you want to put into your types and how much work you want to put into your code, and how much the machine can help you with your code. Okay. So let, let, let's look at a, a slightly more interesting function. Um, so I'm going to define a function called uh, take prime, because there's already one with this uh, type, which is going to take some natural number n, and then some vect of something. Uh, I call it. I'll just call it question n, a, and then a vect of some other number of a's. I didn't like that. Okay. Okay. So. Let's say it did let me do this. Um, in the first case, I'm wanting to take n elements from some vector. How, how many elements am I getting back? m minus n? Oh, really? Just just n. N. Oh, wait, no. I, I want the first n elements. Yeah. Yeah, so I get n back. Yeah, OK. Just see if you're paying attention. Or less. <laughs> or less. But if, if I'm being, so, so in Haskell it would be or less. Yeah. Here I, I'm actually able to say, well, I'm actually going to get this many back. Oh, right. And the question right. then becomes, what, what do I put here? A number bigger than n. Right. At least as big as n. Exactly. And how, can I, how, how might you represent a number at least as big as n? n plus a proof that it's a, sorry, m plus a proof that m is at least n? That's one it. way to do it. Um, I think there's an easier way to do it. So one way we can do this is we can actually, in our argument, write ah. n plus m. Ah. Right? And now our type checker is happy. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually lots of different signatures you can give take, and it's kind of an open question which one of them will be the most practical as dependent types become more practical for daily use. Um, I, I'm partial to this one because I think it's a nice demo. So let's say I want to take uh, zero elements from x's. Well, what's my answer going to be? Nil. No. Yeah, exactly. It'll be nil. No. OK, so that's easy enough. But let's say I want to take the successor of some k elements out of x's. Well, let's, let's take a look at, uh, at the type here. Well, we can see that we're because our input n is length or is s of k, then our output is going to be s of k because we have the same n in both places. But we can also see that we know a little bit about our x's here. In other words, we know that it's length s of k plus m because n is equal to s of k. So we get that by a simple substitution. This means that there's only one reasonable pattern for x's. So if I say, you know, give me a case split here, I only get back one pattern. And 
if I reload and then ask for the type of this right-hand side, I can see that, in fact, um, you know, x is now is plus km, whereas x is some a. So I know I'm going to keep my a, and I'm going to do a little more work, and so can Idris solve it for me? It, it can't this time, unfortunately. Uh, auto isn't smart enough. So what do I need to do here? Yes? Um, that, um, I mean, uh, take, yeah. take one. Take one? Oh, no, take n minus one, take k. Yeah, take so k. that's to say k, k right. yeah, with n minus one, x is. And just take prime there. Uh, thank prime. you. Okay. I'm like an American keyboard, right? Uh, so this is actually a Danish keyboard with U.S. international layout, but I'm ah. used to typing on a Kinesis, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's just how it goes. Okay, right. So let's, let's, let's write drop together using the same pattern. Okay, so I, I want to drop n elements from some vector, and how long should that vector be? n plus m. Yeah, exactly. It's the exact same pattern as before. And then I'm going to get back, after I've dropped the first n elements, how many will remain? M. Exactly. Vect n a. OK. So once again, well, first we need to see how many elements we're working with. We're working with zero elements. And if we're working with zero elements, then we can see that our right-hand side should be precisely the same length as x is up here, even though you're seeing it in the unevaluated form. We know that 0 plus anything is that thing. So can I just solve it? Ah. Indeed it can. OK. And in the other case, the right-hand side 2, we can see that we need back a vect m of a. Well, clearly we're going to need to do a case split on x's because that's the only way we can get anywhere close to anything that looks like that M. <clears throat> so we do a case split on X's. Uh, once again, there's only one pattern, because we know that it's at least one, because there was that successor constructor in there. And now, uh, reloading and taking a look at the type, we can see that now we have an X, which is of type A, and an X's, which is of type vect K plus M A. And we have our K nat. So can Idris solve it? No. What do we need to do? Uh, drop. Yeah. K. Um, X's. Yeah. Drop K from X's. So you, I, may I ask you a question earlier yeah. or not, um, about the built-in natural numbers? Mm -hmm. They're really not built up out of. You said there was a hack to make so, it efficient. So they are defined this way in the standard library, but the compiler does some special casing because they're used so often and represents them with uh, GMP integers. What, what integers? I think GMP integers. What, whatever it is that uh, Haskell is using for its default uh, unbounded int. So the compiler is written entirely in Haskell. So. And so it's just as represented as a Haskell data type. And then at runtime, in compiled code, it gets convert. It, it uses the same library that Idris uses for unbounded ints, um, and this in print can done be done in principle for other types. It just hasn't been done yet. Okay, so so that was this uh, sort of first introduction to dependent types. Um, so yeah, just to sort of recap, what we saw was that pattern matching one argument to a function can affect the other, the patterns that are being matched against other arguments, right? And this is done through unification, basically. So we saw that when we did, when we got nil out of the first case, that we knew that our length n was zero, so we knew that other instances of, of n also had to be zero. And if we tried to use something which forced it to be successor of something, then we'd have a unification error and it wouldn't type check. Um, and we also, you know, we saw that, like by not type checking, some of these patterns rule other ones out which means that if we're careful with the indices, then we can avoid having sort of stupid default cases, which is kind of nice. Um, we also saw that the form of one pattern can be completely determined by the form of another pattern, 
This was the case in zip, where we saw that in the first case, if the first argument was nil, the second one also had to be nil. If the first was cons, the second also had to be cons. That's nice. And which is to say, when, when arguments are related by something, then we learn something about them by about one of them by mat matching against the other one. And we saw this, for example, with take and drop, where the length of the vector is determined in part by the first natural number n. Okay. And actually, I was going to demo this after. Sorry, I got confused there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's what happens. No plan survives contact with the enemy. That sense. Yeah. Anyways, um, okay. So th that was sort of straightforward dependent pattern matching. There's, in some cases, it's not so easy. In some cases, we need to do like a recursive call in order to figure out what to match against further. And so to do that, we have something called the with rule, which is a syntax that I that was first done in this programming language epigram, which is this really sort of groundbreaking dependently typed language from the mid 2000s, I believe. And so you can see with as being a little bit like pattern guards in Haskell, if you've seen those before, um, or view patterns. It's a bit you can use it to implement views, which is quite nice. Um, and it's a way of sort of moving a case to the left-hand side of the equal sign. Okay. So, just as, as a demonstration of the kind of thing you can do with the with rule, we'll first uh, define a data type called snock list. Snoose list, snock list. So snock is just cons backwards. And that's a data type that's parameterized over some other list and gives back type. And it has two constructors. We have snock nil, and snock nil is a snock list of the empty list. And then snock cons, I'll just call it snock actually, that's much better. Um, and snock of x's, which is a list of a, and x, which is an a is giving you back a snock list. Drag this over a bit. Of x's append the singleton list containing x. OK. And then I, I need, to, for sort of boring technical reasons, this isn't going to pass, but this is the thing that I want to write. In fact, uh, the compiler isn't able to figure out what type this thing is due to that overloading that we mentioned earlier. So I just have to write uh, nil and then a equal a. So that's just me giving the type argument to nil explicitly. Welcome. Oh, sorry. No worries. OK. And that passes. So this is just a way of saying, like, give me nil where the, contain where the thing contained in it is the, this a that we're working with otherwise. OK. Then I have a function which, so, so, or what you can think of this as being is a kind of list that's built up from the front to the back instead of from the back to the front. So at any particular time, we're either starting at the beginning with an empty list, which is snock nil, or we're taking some other snock list and sticking something on the end. But when we stick something on the end, what we're doing is we're showing inside of our type that this was equal to some other list where we, some other normal list where we used our list append operation to stick something on the end. Um, this may seem completely useless, and it would be if we didn't have our nice with rule independent pattern matching. But with those, I can write this function snocked. Um, and so snocked takes some uh, list of A's called X's, and then it gives me back a copy of snock list of x's. So note that this x's over here is the exact same x's we got as input, which is to say that we need to convince the type checker that the snock list data type that we return, or the instance of snock list that we return, that the, the, the x's in its type, the list in its type is the same as the list that we got as an argument here, the exact same list. OK. So as before. Um, why am I typing this by hand? I have a computer available that knows more, that knows at least as much as I do. Okay. <laughs> That's hopefully not entirely true. 
Okay. But, um, so if we do a pattern match on X's, well, if we look at our data type snock list, we obviously know how to construct an instance of snocked of the empty list, right? Because we have it right here. Um, so I say, give that to me, and it does. Great. So let's say I want to do a snocked of, of this thing here. I ask the compiler for type info. And I can see that I what it wants is given some x in A and some x's in list of A, it wants me to, to, to give back a snock list in x cons x's. And we don't know how to produce that, right? Because the only way we can produce uh, an instance of snock or, or use the snock constructor is if we have a list which consists of some x's with a singleton list appended to the end. So, so we're, we're kind of stuck, right? What we can do is we can look and, and see, actually, we know how to do it for the tail of the list because that's what the type of our function says, right? Like for, for any x's, we're able to produce a snock list of it. And so once we've done that, maybe it'll help us out a little bit. So the way we do this recursive call is with that with rule that I mentioned a little while ago. So I ask the compiler to generate it for me very nicely, and then I say, you know, call yourself recursively on the tail. And then I can do a case split over here. So with pad is just the, this is just the name of a pattern variable that was generated here. I could just have written x's or y's or sl for stock list or something, but I case split that and note that something happened to the left of the vertical bar. Right, so if you remember that dependent pattern matching lets me use information that I've gotten about one argument to learn something about another argument if some parts of it are known to unify. And we know that whatever snocked returns, it's going to be a snock list of the tail of the original list. So if it returns snock nil, that means the original list is a snock list of the empty list, which is to say that the original list was the empty list. So I've discovered something here. And then I'll align my parts here. Um, I think that due to this getting wide, I'm going to rearrange my buffers ever so slightly. Okay. Then, If I ask for the for the type of this meta variable snocked RHS1, and then I can see, well, what I need is a snock list of the singleton list containing X. Right? So, and the reason I need the snock list of the original list containing X is, well, look here, I've got this uh, this is my argument to my function, and I can see that I need snock list of the argument to my function. But Given that it's a singleton list, I know how to use snock in order to produce it, right? Because the singleton list is just the singleton list appended to the empty list, right? So it just isn't smart enough to figure it out for me yet, but I can say snock of the empty list followed by x. And I ask it just to type check it, and if it says everything is fine. So in other words, looking up at the type arguments up here, that, that's completely invisible on this screen. So if I look at the, at the type arguments up here, I see that snock takes some x's, and it's some x, and it gives me back a snock list of x's with the singleton list containing x stuck to the end. And I needed a snock of the list containing x, and I get that straightforwardly by combining these two things. Then I have my other case, which is when x's was some list consisting of y's with y appended, and, well, clearly it's going to be snock because it's not the empty list we're dealing with. And then the argument is going to be uh, x colon colon y, right? Because that's how we stick something on the front of a list, which is what we need to do here. And we know that the last element of the list was y, so we say that. And now what we've done is we've demonstrated that any list can be represented 
as repeated appends of singleton lists to the empty list, essentially. And this may seem like the most useless thing in the world. <laughs> and it would be. But we can use it to construct other functions using dependent pattern matching. So let's say I want to write a function called rot. And what rot is going to do is it's going to take some natural number and some list, and it's going to give back the list where the last n elements have been moved to the front. Right, so we're sort of pushing things, pushing the list over and moving things up. So then I want to say rot of n of, and again, I need to have the compiler do work for me. OK. So I want to if I want to rotate something zero places, then I'm going to do nothing. So I just say x's. And if I'm going to rotate it 1 plus k places, well, what I need to do, I need to get the last element and move it to the front. And I know how to get the last element, because I just need to view the list as a snock list. Right? So I, I sort of I say with snocked x's. And then I have two possibilities of what x's was. Um, clearly, rotating the empty list should just be the empty list. So that's the empty list. And rotating the list that has x at the end is just the list with x at the front. And then we rotate it k more times. right? So we say that becomes simply rot of k of x colon colon y's. So what I've done is I've used this dependent pattern matching to tell me information about something based on building up some other structure. So when people talk about views, this is one way to implement them using dependent types. So I, I think that's kind of a fun demo. So then if I go over to the to my redevelop print loop here, I can say rot for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I can see that I've moved the last four elements to the front of the list. OK. Why is it that you don't have to decrement k or something? That's like a recursive, like, yeah, there. So successor of k is what you started with. Yeah, so we can see that the oh, argument oh, to the okay. function was k plus 1. And yeah. Okay. And if, if I write it that way, like k plus 1 instead of a successor of k? Maybe. I forget. <laughs> um, so there, there is a, normally I would say no. So, but, and, 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 the, and the correct pedagogical thing for me to say is no, but the technical needling thing <laughs> is that there is a sort of special n plus k pattern thing used in the implementation of the optimization okay. of NATs, but ignore that. Okay. You shouldn't care <laughs> about it. I mean, just come to think of it, even you have, oh, I guess you can do the y's plus plus x because that's exactly what comes from the width. Yeah, so, so normally you can't write something in a pattern which isn't a constructor or pattern variables. But in this case, we know that this term, we know that this term here has to be that because of unification with the index of the constructor snock. Right. So we're only allowed to write those things if we have some evidence for it being that. And that evidence here is the fact that the recursive call gave us back the constructor snuck. But um, what is exactly does the width clause do? So what width does is it? In this case. Yeah. So so width just lets you in introduce another expression into your pattern match. So. Well, where does it appear in the pattern match? Over to or the right hand side of the bar. The res that's the result of width. Oh. So if I wanted to be really clean here, then I would write. Or perhaps there. Yeah. All right. So, so whatever whatever this evaluates to is what we pattern match on the right hand side of the pipe, and the the, th the stuff on the left hand side of the pipe are the things that we've already been matching against. And by matching something, uh, by matching the result of this, we learn something about what X has had to be which is why we have these things here. Uh, so you're matching against the patterns in the results of, of 
it's knocked X's. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see this as, as like writing case, except the difference between this and a case expression on the right-hand side of the equals sign is that this lets us see, um, or lets us impose restrictions on earlier patterns as well. Okay. In Haskell, these things are still on the left side of the equal sign. They're not on the right side. So you can you can do pattern guards. Oh, maybe I don't know about it. So th th this is a little bit like pattern guards in Haskell, mm -hmm. but but typically a recursive call will be on the right hand side, and and it'll have a case expression. Right, so you, you have pattern match the patching to the left of the equal sign, but in sort of straight up old school Haskell ninety eight, you don't have oh, you only pattern have matching of calls new recursive right. calls. Yeah. And this kind of thing only become, would be useful in Haskell if you're working with JDTs anyway. Because that's what starts getting you these interesting equality constraints. Right. So if you didn't want to use width, could you have done a case of x's, let's say x's tuple snocked x's, and then you'd still only end up with two case? So case in Idris doesn't give you dependent pattern matching. Okay. But you can you could implement the same thing by defining another function and then calling that like a helper function which had the, all the all three patterns. It's just much less fun. <laughs> um, and actually, with behind the scenes gets translated into a new top level function okay. when it's during compilation because it simplifies things. So case you can't pattern match, you said? You can pattern match, but it doesn't give you full dependent pattern matching. It just gives you normal pattern matching. Oh, so the compiler won't be able to figure out that there should only be two cases. It would expect all four. Um, all four being... So maybe it's more than... But so, so it, it wouldn't, wouldn't have give you the reduce... equality of the pattern variable with this expression. Okay. And that's the important Right, so you wouldn't here. be able to write that yeah. as the y's plus plus x. Right. You could write it without that equality, couldn't you? Uh, no. No, you can't write it. Yeah. So, so if I want to say like, I mean that 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 wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? Like you could, you could maybe treat it as a pattern that would never get matched, but that seems kind of crazy. <laughs> like if I want to say, uh, oh, let's see, let's say I wanted to write foo, which is list a to at, and foo is going to count up the number of things to the left of the append. <laughs> <laughs> right, so if I wanted to say, and you said you couldn't do that kind of pattern matching, or you can do that kind of pattern matching with the uh, with the plus plus in there. Uh, you, it, it's not okay. going to work. Okay, <laughs> but you, you can see why this would be you completely insane, to. right? Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm still yeah. not sure. I, I find yeah. snock anything but insane. But with the okay, so so the reason the reason why that makes sense is that you've justified having that expression there right, right, right. Just, by kind of by this argument, which is constructing that snocked thing, the snock list instance. Right. Whereas if I was allowing arbitrary expressions on the left hand side of patterns, then the function would need to know not what its argument had been evaluated to, but what its argument had been evaluated from. No, no, I mean the, the result type of the snot constructor, that yeah. was the first part that like, kind of broke my head. Sure. A bit with yeah, the, that's dependent the types yeah. right there. <laughs> I mean, that's right there is the programming language itself occurring in the types. Right. And once you've got that, then all the rest of this kind of falls out. But it takes a little bit of, of time to wrap the head around it, I think. OK. So that was the width rule. Um, so, how many people here have seen AVL trees before? As sort of like a basic data structures course. Is the camera okay? So, an, an AVL tree is just as, as a refresher because I, you know, I hadn't seen it in a few years when I had to come back to it recently. It's a, a balanced binary tree where the heights of the child branches differ by at most one. So, it, it's very close related to a red black tree, but specified a little bit differently and it's got slightly tighter bounds on it. If you went to school like earlier, you would have not done red black and done AVL. <laughs> So that's what we did in college. So anyways, um, when you're inserting something into an AVL tree, like, is, you use sort of rotations to recover this invariant about the heights of the subtrees 
if they otherwise would be imbalanced. So we have this tree here, which is left-leaning. It's got you know three and two nodes, and we want to insert one. So we, we insert a one, and then, oh no, it, the, the heights differ by two. So what we do is we do a right rotation, and then we get two at our root, and then we now have restored balance. OK. So this one I'm not going to type in in front of you, because it would take too long. But I'm just going to sort of what? walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> How long do you want to be here? <laughs> OK. OK, so once again, I start off with my B total by default. Then I, the first thing I'm going to need in order to guarantee this balance invariant is I'm going to need a representation of what it means to be balanced, which is to say, what does it mean for two numbers to differ by at most one? A simple way to, de to represent this is to define a data type called balance instances of balance are going to ensure that the relationship between their arguments are, in fact, this at most one difference relationship. So a tree can be left-leaning, in which case the left subtree would have height suck of n, and the right subtree would have height n, which is to say n plus 1 and n. Uh, it could be right-leaning, in which case the right subtree has height n plus 1, while the left subtree has height n. Or it could be balanced, which is to say that both subtrees have an equal height. Okay. And then I dumb question, but yeah. what about if it's two off? Then it's not balanced. Oh, it's balanced. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's a good question. So, not, so, so what we could see is that one one way that people like to talk when they're talking about dependent types and lo intuitionistic logic and things like that is they say that this data type is a type of witnesses or evidence that these two numbers are in this balance relationship. So um, once we've got this balance relationship of two numbers, we can say, what is the height of a tree with that balance? So remember that it's got, it's got this sort of hidden nat here called n. So we can use that n together with whether it was left, right, or balance to say, what is the height of the tree with this invariant? And we'll use that when we're constructing the next step up. So height is just a function that takes balance nm and gives back a net. So this uh, curly brace syntax here is just saying that n, which I had sort of mentioned as being totally implicit, make that available to me. So if I want to say that left-leaning of n, well, the height of a left-leaning tree of n is n plus 2. Right? Because we know that the left subtree was height n plus 1, so the entire tree is going to be n plus 2 if we count the next node up. Um, a right-leaning tree, same thing. And then a balanced tree is going to be of height successor of n. And that's simply because we have n n here. So 1 plus n is the height of the tree with left and right subtrees of height n. Okay. Then we can define our tree here. So the tree data type takes three parameters. It takes a natural number representing the height of the tree. It takes two types representing the types of keys and the types of values. So this is being used as kind of a key value store. And then empty is a zero height tree uh, containing, you know, for, for some type k and some type v. It doesn't really matter. And we say that node takes a left tree, which is of height n, containing key k and value v. Then we have an actual key of type k, an actual value of type v. Then we have a right subtree, which is of height m, with, but containing the same key and value types, k and v. And then we have this balance witness, which is what's going to guarantee that n and m have this correct relationship, right? which is to say that either they're equal or one of them is precisely one greater than the other. And then the result of that is going to be a tree whose height is computed from the balance witness and containing key k and value v. Any questions? That was a big, that was a big reading aloud of code there. <laughs> okay. So then the, 
compiler figures out how to implement ABL trees for you? No, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in like 10 years when Microsoft is releasing like, you know, visual dependent F sharp version 9. <laughs> then they'll have got all that worked out. I mean, I, I think in theory it's possible. <laughs> the difficulty is making it fast and making it user friendly and making it pick the right things here. Um, notice that this tree isn't guaranteeing certain things, so we'll, we usually want to assume some kind of ordering invariant as well, right? That that everything in the left subtree is less than the current key, and everything in the right subtree is greater than the current key. Um, you can totally put that into the type; it just makes it longer and hairier. So, sort of a, a, a it's important to. Think about the trade-offs of complexity of guaranteeing the invariance you want versus how difficult it is to make it happen. Um, and sometimes you might want to prove these things separately or just say, I'm going to test this part. OK. So uh, uh, an example of a bad tree would be sort of node with a node with an empty left subtree and then a right subtree that's too deep where each of them is right-leaning. So we, we can't construct that. If we want to do a lookup in the tree, that looks just like it would in Haskell, except it has a single colon instead of a double colon, and it has double arrows instead of a single arrow. <laughs> um, in other words, looking up in the empty tree is nothing, and then looking up in, uh, in a node with left and right subtrees L and R, and a, key, and a key called key, well, we compare the key we're looking for with the key we found. If it's less than, we go to the left. If it's equal, we return the value that we found. And if it's greater, then we go to the right. Type classes work the same way? Mostly. Okay. Um, you, you can do some crazier things with them, but the, the same basic idea is there. OK. Yeah. OK. So um, in order to insert into our tree, we're going to need one little helper data type, because we don't know what's going to happen to the actual height of the tree. Right? If, if we insert into a left-leaning tree, then we're actually going to get back something that's the same height, because you know, we'll send it to the maybe we'll send it down to the right, and then the the height won't change. But we'll have a balanced tree now. Whereas if we insert it into a balanced tree, it's possible, but not necessarily the case, that the tree will get taller. So this data type represents what can happen to the height of the tree we're inserting into. So either it stays flat or it goes up by one. So in other words, it, flat gives me a tree of NKV and I get an insert result of NKV, whereas taller takes a tree that's one higher than what I was looking for. OK. Um, then I have left rotation. So left rotation takes a tree of NKV. Uh, I'm going to make the font slightly smaller. Is that readable from the back? Yeah. yeah. OK. So it takes a tree of NKV, which is to say a left subtree. And then it takes a, a key and a value. And then it takes the right subtree that I wanted, which we see is two taller than the left subtree. Which is, this is why we, we weren't able to construct a node immediately when we were doing our insert. Um, and we can't just have the rotation take a node because they're impossible to construct because of the type system. And then it's going to give us back this insert result of the height that we had there. OK. so. First off, we check and see, so we're doing this by a case split on the right subtree. And well, the right subtree could not have been empty, right? Because we know that it has height s of s of n. And the empty tree has height 0. This is completely impossible. Um, oftentimes, the compiler isn't smart enough to figure out that something is impossible until you say it. In general, it's actually a pretty difficult problem. So, so it gets it gets all the simple cases right, but in more complicated cases, you actually just have to write impossible instead of the equal sign. And what that does is it just ensures that whatever is to the left of the word impossible will not type check. Okay. Then uh, I rotate left. If yeah, so say we had a, a balanced subtree of height suck of suck of n to the right. All right. So 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 now that we've discovered we have a node, we're doing a case split on the balance condition. And well, then we know it's going to get taller. And so what we do is we construct a right-leaning tree over on the left, right, by sort of pushing things downward to the left. 
and then the, this value here, which was in the supposed right subtree, becomes the new top. Remember how we had that rotation on the slide? That's exactly what's happening here. Um, and then we have to deal with the cases where the right-hand tree was left-leaning, where it was right-leaning, and it, it's all basically the same thing that's happening. Um, yeah, and so on and so forth. So all of these cases are really tr tedious to write. It's a real pain to get them correct. But having the type system there catches some of the mistakes you might make. And if you put more information in the types, like the ordering invariant, it would catch even more mistakes that you might make. Can it write any of it for you, or is that? Very little, unfortunately. Um, and then the right rotation is the mirror image of the left rotation. OK. Then our insert type should uh, take a new key and a new value and some tree and give us back this insert result, which is to say a tree which is either the same height or one higher. So if we wanted to insert into empty, well, we get back something that's taller, obviously, because <laughs> the height goes up by one. And that's just the node with empty left and right subtrees with the new key and value in it. If we got a node, well, then what we need to do is compare our key with the new key. This doesn't necessarily need the with rule because I'm not really using dependent pattern matching here, but it's convenient notationally, I think. So the, the with rule is also allowed in those cases. And we're also going to use dependent pattern matching in a little while. We found that it was equal, so we just, you know, if it's equal, then we just replace it. Because it's being used as sort of like a, a dictionary type. And then otherwise, we do an insert, and we see that we got back if we got back flat, then we get flat, and taller we get taller. And we're seeing that if this is left-leaning or balanced or right-leaning on the right-hand side, then in some cases we need to do a rotation, right? So if, if we got back a left-leaning tree here, and the thing we're inserting was less than the key, then we, would end, then we know we have to pass it to the left, but then we'd end up with something that broke the balance invariant. So we use our right rotation to recover that. And so here's something where the type system at least catches you from putting the rotations in the wrong spot. And then if it was greater than, then we have to remember to do our left rotation in the case that we're inserting into a right-leaning tree. Okay. Uh, then, if we want to convert a list of pairs into such a tree, we get a new tool in our toolbox, which is what's called the dependent pair. So a dependent pair is a lot like a normal pair, except the second item can be dependent on the first item, which is to say that whatever value you put in the first element of, in, in the left-hand bit of the pair can occur in the type of the right-hand element. So what we're returning from our from list is some height and then a tree with that height. Right, so, so that whatever n we put here has to be the n over here. And so converting the empty list to a tree is obviously a zero height tree called empty. And if we convert the, the list starting with the pair kv, then well, we insert them. And then get proof is just the name of the second projection of the dependent pair. So it extracts the second element. So in other words, we, we call the function recursively, and then we extract the second element. And then we sort of check whether or not it was flat or taller. And underscore here says, compiler, solve it for me. And it does. OK. And then flatten is simply uh, rec recursing over the tree and constructing a list. OK. And just to sort of show that this actually works. Uh, oh, is that part of it? That's part of the goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I like to run my programs, not just type check them. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is a, like a contentious issue sometimes. <laughs> is ship it. <laughs> yeah. Get type check. Put it in production. Did you see that at the bottom of the screen? Oh no. Oh, okay, so interest mode for Emacs, and it, it prints out little like words of encouragement when you start, and one of them is it, it type checks. Ship it. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even see that. Okay. So you're just inferring that. So if you want to say avl dot uh, from this. And then 
we'll call it what? One, one, two, two. Ah, that's fine. <laughs> two, uh, zero, nothing, fifty-four, thirty-four. <laughs> okay, that's an okay number. Twelve. <laughs> And we see that we get back a tree of height three, which consists of nodes which are sort of putting things in the right order. Um, if we if we flatten this, um, we can see uh, and what's that get proof? Um, that's the second projection of a dependent pair. Okay. So it's like oh, nice. SND, okay. except for dependent pairs. They're okay. called get witness and get proof because a way that you can use these is as an existential proof or oh. existential, where you say that the first element of the pair is some thing and the second element tells you something about that thing. Okay. So it's a witness of, of that something holds and then the proof that it in fact holds for that witness. Okay. Um, that that's sort of the logical interpretation of the type, okay. as opposed to the programming interpretation. Is there a reason why you did return a dependent pair with the from list, like that yeah. you return the height at all? I guess. Yeah. So the reason I return the height, let me get back to the code here, is because I need to know what n is when I do the recursive call. Um, right. So. It's, or sorry, no. Yeah, so I, I need to. I the type has to get this end somewhere, and I don't know what the length of the list is. And calculating what the height of the I could I I could instead insert some code that, that looked at the list, and calculated what the height of the resulting tree would be, but that would be a lot of work. And I need to build it and up. You'd have to prove it all here. the way down, right? Yeah, yeah, it would be about as much work as just writing the function by, by hand. And you can't leave it unspecified, but like you can't just let, let, it, let the compiler find the variable or the, let, let it be a free variable? Well, that, I'm letting the compiler find it for me down here. Okay. But in order for the type, I mean, the type, the, the thing in the type has to be something that gets filled in at some point. Okay. Like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make... But I mean, like, the V isn't, isn't bound uh, anywhere, right? It's not, it, it's not specified yeah. anywhere, but that's still... So, so what's going on here actually is behind the scenes when you leave things unspecified like that, they get inserted as arguments to the function that are invisible. Oh. Um, th so they become some impl implicit arguments. Okay. So in Haskell you just get the implicit type arguments. Right. But here you get implicit value arguments as well sometimes. But, but we don't want to have to specify n ahead of time when we call our function. Right, like we, we do want to specify k and v. Right, because we, we want to apply this to some particular list full of pairs of a particular type, and so that's fine. We know what those are. Well, but we don't, we don't know what the height of the tree is ahead of time. We need okay. to compute that as we go. Okay. So, so you, can, you can view these as sort of universal quantification if you're logically minded. Right? And, and, and the n here is just existential, sort of fundamentally, because it it's, it's not the case that will give you back a tree with any height you specify. Okay, so in Haskell, it's to be like returning a type that has for all n, and then the type. The kind of. Kind yeah. Of. Okay. Yeah. Quite similar. Okay, so um, I, want, I think we should have a break for a minute, just so the energy level doesn't get too low, um, and then we'll get into universes. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is called universes, and you can this is being kind of like a design pattern for dependently typed programming. So a universe is what you use when you want to make something that works on some types, but not every type. And where that particular type or collection of types is something that you decide ahead of time, as opposed to being extensible and open, in which case you might use something like a type class. So a universe in this, in this sort of sense of the word consists of two things. It's a data type where instances of that data type or elements of that type are sort of codes that somehow describe the types that you're interested in. 
And then you have an interpretation function which maps those codes to the actual types in question. Um, and so sort of a, a simple and silly example of a universe Um, actually, I'll write this from scratch. So this is different from like type theory, like the hierarchy of universes. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is kind of like the closed type family idea that we're putting yeah, in the GHC now, right? Kinda. Okay. It it addresses similar problems anyway. Okay. So. So it. At a first at a first glance, yes, it's very different. At a second glance, you can actually view types in general as being described as some codes and then being interpreted and it's but for now, treat them as separate. <laughs> okay. I'm guessing like the type that you're making is probably at least one level higher than, than the no, we can make things in, in, types, right? In in the universe. No, it could no. be at the same level. Okay. Okay, so we once again say default total, and then right. So we're gonna what, what was that doing? Again? Yeah. So so um, if if you try to make a function that could potentially lead to an infinite recursion, then Idris will take note of that fact. And if I and by default it'll let you do it, but it won't work inside of types because we want our compiler to terminate. What this does is it makes it an error unless I say allow this one through. Whereas the default behavior of Idris is to only complain if you say I really want this one to be total. So it's just a way to make it a little bit more, you can see it as, as kind of like dash w all in, in some sense, like actually warn me if my function isn't total and I haven't said so. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm going to make a data type called sizable. And sizable is going to contain the code int, the code list of some other thing that's sizable, or the code either of two other sizable things. Okay. Um, I think you can kind of guess what types I'm trying to code for here. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to say that uh, the interpretation function which maps sizable to a type does sort of exactly what you'd expect, right? So we map the code int to the type int. We map the code list of some code x to the type uh, list of the interpretation of x. And then we map the type, or the code either of x, y to the code either of the interpretation of x and the interpretation of y. Okay. So let's 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 take a look at the REPL for a minute. So I can say interp uh, int, and I get back the type int, right? Whereas if I said int alone, it was in the sense of sizable. So you can see that's the difference here. Um, the colors you're getting in the REPL tell you a little bit more about what's going on too. So blue things are types, red things are data constructors, green things are functions. Um, purple things are bound variables. Um, so now if I want to say, you know, uh, interp of list of int, I get back the type list of int. So forth. Okay. So. Now that I have this restricted universe of things that I know how to get a size of, and this is just some completely dumb represent idea of size that I'm using only for demonstration purposes, I can say uh, write a function called size, which takes some code t in sizable, and then it takes some element of the interpretation of t as a type, which is to say uh, interp of t, and then it returns an int, which is the size. Okay. So the size of tx is completely useless, right? Like, I, I don't know what to do with x here, because I don't know what type x is, which means there's no patterns that reasonably apply. But when I do a case split on the code, all of a sudden here, I know that x is an int, right? Because interp of big int is the type int, and we know that the second argument to the function has type interp of 
the code int. So I want an int, so I can just return an int. And Idris is happy. Likewise, um, I want the size of a list of ints to be the sum of the size of the elements, right? I can just say, you know, sum of map of size y of x. And, and just to make it a little more readable, I'm going to call it x's rather than x. Okay. So the reason this works is we know that y is a code for some sizable type. We know that x's is a list of the interpretation of that code based on the definition of interpret for list. And so we know that size y, thus, is something that will compute the size of the element of a list, right? because those are things that are coded for by y. So we can map that over the list, and then we can take the sum of the list, which just adds together the contents of the list. Great. Then, if we have either y and either z, then we have a problem, right? So what we want to do is we, we need to know a little more about x, right? Like, is it the left or is it the right? So we use pattern match. So I'm going to call it, uh, yeah, just call it left x or right x. Okay. And we'll say that in, that in either case, the, this is a completely arbitrary notion of size, but it'll be 1 plus the size of whatever is contained inside the uh, constructor. So that's going to be size of y of x. And it's happy. If I try to copy-paste this down to the second case, it doesn't work, right? And the reason it doesn't work, it's hard to see here, is that it can't unify the interpret of z with the interpret of y. Right? And this is as it should be. If, if it could do that, we'd have, a, we'd have a terrible problem. Because we know that x here, because we got the right constructor, is going to be of interpret of z. So we're seeing that we got this kind of interplay of our data type and the actual either type going on, which is guiding the type checker and putting everything exactly where it needs to be. So that was a very simple example of what they call generic programming with universes. In other words, I've, I've represented some types, I've, and then based on that representation of types, I've shown how to construct a size function for anything that is represented in that way. Okay. Great. So, yeah. One sort of classic use of these universes is in something which is called the well-typed interpreter. Uh, I believe the first one was written by Leonard Augustin in the late 90s using the Cayenne language. But what you do is you sort of generate a universe of simple types, which is to say simple types in the sense of simply typed lambda calculus. And then we get interest to show the correctness of an interpreter for the simply typed lambda calculus. Okay. So getting back to this, we have module interpreter. Okay. The indentation code here is copy pasted from Haskell mode, so sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, we're, we're trying to improve it, but resources are limited. <laughs> and if anyone here is handy with eList, we would love to have your contributions later. Okay. All right, so we say default total, and then um, define a universe of simple types. So we say, first thing we need is we want to use a, a long double arrow as a constructor for arrow types here. Ignore the funny highlighting. That's also my fault. <laughs> so I can say that our universe tie is then going to consist of booleans, because that, that's just an arbitrarily chosen base type for the universe, or it's going to be some tie arrow, some other tie. Right? And name tie t. Doesn't like that. Why doesn't it like that? Right. Can't do that yet. Parser limitation.
There we go. Okay. Right? Is everyone on board with what this means? Types are the types of the functions we want to represent are just Boolean or a function on Booleans, returning Booleans or functions on Booleans. Yeah. Okay. The interpretation function of this is going to be fairly straightforward, right? We type of takes a tie and give me back a type. And the type of bool is bool. And the, and, and the interpretation of t arrow u is just interpretation of t, and then arrow the interpretation of u. Right? And it's not called interp, but it's called type of. Whoa. Uh, great. OK. So this is exactly Idris's function arrow here. So it's just a normal, because remember that types are terms like any others. So we can just return a type from a function. And that also includes arrow types. So sometimes Idris doesn't have enough information to know what the types of these implicit arguments are. So we use using to tell it that. So it's a way to say that within the scope of this using block, if you see an n, consider it to be a nat. And if you see ctxt, then consider it to be a vect of n ties. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be able to. Otherwise, when we put in ctxt somewhere, it wouldn't be able to sort of work backwards and know what is n, and it would complain at me. OK. That can define a data type term, which takes a, a vector of n types, and then give a type, and gives back a type. OK. So what, what I'm saying now is that terms in the simply type lambda calculus, or the, the, the type that's going to represent terms, takes sort of two parameters. One of those parameters is the typing context in which the term is valid, right? So it's going to be the, the types of the surrounding variables, because in order to know the type of some variable x, we need to look up and see, like, where is x bound? Like, is it the argument to a function that's accepting a bool? Then x is a bool. If it's an argument to a function that wants a bool to bool function, then x is a bool to bool function, that kind of thing. And so we're going to sort of have on hand a list of the types of the variables that are available. And then we're also going to have the actual type of the expression in question. OK. So true is a term in any context with type bool. False is a term in any context with type bool. And if takes a term in some context of type bool and then a term in some context of some type t. right? So this is the then branch of the if. And then it takes a term in some context in, with, with type t again, which is to say that the if and the then branches of, of the if, or the then and the else branches of the if have to have the same type. And they have to be in the, everything has to be in the same context as well, because our if is sort of sticking together in the program. And then we get back a term in the same context with type t, right? Because no matter what the no matter what the condition was, it'll still be type t that comes out of the if. Okay. Then now that we're done with booleans, you know, we have a way of constructing booleans and a way of using them. We now need a way of doing functions. So the first thing we can do with a function is we can apply it. So it, so a term in some context with type t arrow u. Um, is the first thing. In other words, we need a function to apply. And then we need a term in some context. And what type should it have? T. T, exactly. So in other words, we need an argument which is the right argument type for the function that we're trying to apply. And we get back a term in that context with type... U. Yeah. So the right-hand side of the function arrow. And now come the interesting cases. Uh, a lambda takes a term in some context extended by t. Mm -hmm. All right, so, the, so the body of the function um, is going to be some term that 
given some variable of type t gives us back some, some result of type u. And then we can construct from that a term of type t r u. And finally, we need a variable. Context extended by t, that's definitely just the context. From on the previous term. This one here? Yeah, is the, is that's, no, no, no. On the, on the right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the reason we don't have t here is because the lambda itself doesn't have the variable available. Oh, the it's only the body of the okay. lambda that has that available. Okay. And we can have variables. Okay. So then we have something here called fin. Fin is another one of those dependent types thing. I didn't put the, the, the definition up earlier because I think it's easier just to say what it is. And it's a type of numbers that are less than n. Right, so fin of 0 has no elements. Fin of 1 has precisely one element, that is 0. Fin of 2 has precisely two elements, which are 0 and 1, and so forth. Right, and so we know that n is our natural number. So, and we know that our context has length n. So we can use this fin as a way to sort of have a bound-safe lookup in the context. So that's a term in this context, which remember has type has length n up here from our declaration. And the type is then index i uh, context. So in other words, to get the type of a variable, we simply look up however many steps in the context it is. So this is a trick called uh, de Brown indexes, which is sort of well-known in the programming languages community, but not so well-known outside of it. And the idea is that you represent variables instead of using a name, you use a number, and the number counts outward every step of bindings. So like, if I said variable zero, it would find the closest lambda to that variable, and that's the variable I'm referring to. If I said variable of seven, it would count sort of you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then get there and say, okay, it's that variable I'm pointing at. And this is less convenient for users. Like, you wouldn't want to have users actually typing into Brown indices, but very, very convenient for sort of the interpreter and compiler writers. So that's what we're doing right now, so we're going to use it. OK. So then I can say uh, percent name term tm tm prime tm prime prime. OK. So just to, to sort of get a little bit of a flavor of how these things work, let's define Boolean negation in this language. So we say not is a term in the empty context that takes a Boolean and gives us a Boolean, right? OK. So what does it not like here? Right, indentation problem. Okay. So we take a look and we see that on our right hand side we need something that in the empty context has type bool arrow bool. Um, <laughs> obviously, Idris isn't going to help us with this. Okay. <laughs> Good try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Agda would actually solve that one, but uh, so then we did, well, we, if we look up here, we see well we need a function. The way we create a function is with lambda, right? Like that—that's the only thing we have where the right-hand side has an arrow in it. So we know that we're going to need lambda. Now, if we take a look, we see that we need something that has type bool, where there's one variable available which has a type bool. So we could just return that, but then it wouldn't be Boolean negation, so that would be wrong. <clears throat> so what I'm going to say is uh, obviously if, and then we need a variable, right? So we'll say var 0, because that's the only variable available is the, the, the 0th position. And if the variable was true, then we want to return false. If the variable is false, we want to return true. And now we have Boolean negation. 
can't you just like really look forward to sort of using this example to sell the boss on the idea of functional programming? <laughs> <laughs> we can brown index our variables, then we won't have to worry about how to name them. Yeah. Okay. Um, another function I want to write is something I'm calling choose, and choose takes three arguments, a boolean and two others, and if the boolean was true, it returns the first argument, otherwise it returns the second. Okay. So just with that nat there, yeah. sorry, the not, could you have done it for any context and then just sure. you extend it with... Yeah, I, I can just write it. It's just fine. Okay. Um, so very good question. So that'll be more general then. Right? Yeah, totally. Um, I was just trying to be easy. Here. Right, yeah. Okay, so we have a term. So choose is going to take a term in, is going to be a term in any context which is bool, 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 bool. That's a lot of bools. Do they have to be bools or could they be arbitrary terms? Um, so now we're dealing with the simply typed lambda calculus and I'm so trying to sort of stay in those bounds. Okay. So we have to sort of make one for each type. Okay. Um, I could sort of try to use Idris as a macro language for the simply typed lambda calculus. and. Are you trying not? Yeah, and do generation there, but I want to keep myself just sort of in this okay. little world. Okay. So I wanted to find this this function choose. So I need arrow type. It's an arrow type here, right? So the only thing I can do to return an arrow is lambda. And again, the only thing I can do is lambda, right? So I need I need one lambda for each of the three arrows. Uh, and then I want to say... So if we look at our right-hand side, we can see that it's expecting something that's going to return a Boolean in this context where there's sort of three Boolean variables. So what we want to do is have our if, but if needs to know sort of which variable to look at, which means now we need to think a little bit, right? Because we want it to be the first argument that determines which of the others we're getting. Remember that the Brown indices, we sort of count outwards. So we want the first argument, that means we want the one that we extended the context with first, as a which is the, the outermost lambda. So in order to get to our outermost lambda, we need to say var two, right? So zero, one, two, like count outwards. And then if it's true, then we want var one. Otherwise, we want var zero. Great. Those are two sort of simple functions in this version of the simply typed lambda calculus. Did you like define not in terms of choose? Yeah. Uh, totally. So. So it's going to take a lambda, and then it's going to be choose var zero. Then false true. Right? Yeah, or I guess you could, could you make it that where you're actually passing in the true and the false? Right? You could use like app, right? Yeah. In other, yeah, I guess parameter, I guess theoretically parameterized. Cause I, yeah, so actually this action, sorry, I was actually getting ahead of myself. This needs to be app of choose to. Alright. Yeah. So choose applied to var zero, and then that applied to false, and then add, and then we don't need this. Yeah, so that's actually how it would be. <laughs> it's not very pleasant. Okay. Yeah, you're right. The first one was better. Yeah. Okay. So now we can say, uh, let's say we want to, to actually like evaluate these terms, right? Because an interpreter is useless if we can only construct programs. And maybe, maybe type checking them is fun, but we type check them because we want to run them without them going wrong. So the first thing we do in order to run our programs is we need some sort of like runtime stack, right? Like we need some data structure that's going to contain the types that, or sorry, contain the variables that are existing 
so that when we hit a variable, we can look up in the structure and say, what is the current value that this variable has in this context? So we can say data n, which is taking a vector of n types to a type, and then nil is an n in the empty vector, and cons is going to take some element of the type of some code t, and then uh, env in t's, and give us back, actually I'll call it context for the sake of consistency, and give us back an env in the context extended by t. And it's not happy, what did I do? Really? Ah. Parser errors are not always giving the best error messages yet. Okay. So, what I've said here is that a runtime stack for, for a term that doesn't have any variables is obviously empty. So that's the nil case. And the cons case is to say that if we have some variable with type t and a runtime stack for some context somewhere, that if we have that con that variable in the context as well, that obviously we need, we need some element of the interpretation of that code t. And then we have our runtime stack extended with a variable. Okay. Now, we need a way of looking things up in here. We can say that lookup takes some i in fin n and some environment in context. And remember earlier we gave this annotation that context has length n, and that's the same n we have here, and that's important. And then we have, we're returning the actual element that we found, so we need the interpretation of looking up i in the context. <laughs> right, so context is a variable of types, or a variable of codes for types, rather. So we get back something that we know is within bounds to do a lookup. So we can do a lookup in there to figure out what type it is, and then a further, at the same time, rather, we end up doing a lookup in the, in the values, and we get back the value and the type, and it all fits. Then we can say that lookup is going to be written for me, partially. Okay. So fz is just the zero version of fin. And if we have that, then we can say, then we know that our environment starts with x and we're returning x, right? Because it's the first thing in the environment. Otherwise, we do look up x and it's not happy because that's actually not correct, right? We needed to actually sort of peel one element off in order for the types to match up. Then we can say look up x, z. Oh no. Now it's happy. Finally, we can say eval. And what eval does is it takes a term in, in some context with type t, and then it takes a runtime evaluation stack for that exact same context, which is to say that the types of the variables we have of the types of the values we have available match the types of the variables in the context in which the term is well defined or well typed. And then finally, we're actually going to get back a real Idris value. And that real Idris value is uh, whatever the interpretation of the correct type. The type of the Idris value is the interpretation of the type of the simply typed Lambda calculus term. Okay. So we do this by pattern matching on the term in question. Okay. So if we, if we ask it, so what's the type of this term, or of this meta variable for the right-hand side of true? Well, it, it's a really just Boolean, right? And so we obviously want to turn the just Boolean true. Likewise, the second right-hand side has is going to be an Idris Boolean, and that's false. So we return the Idris Boolean false. Um, in the case of if, well, let's take a look. Um, we have 
our our context here, our Idris context. We have a Boolean, which is called tum, and we have two things of type T, which are called tum prime and tum prime prime. And we have a context in which we can evaluate those things to get back some T, and we want back a T. These are all the ingredients we need to reuse Idris' own if. Right? So we can say if eval tum x. And I'm going to call this xenv instead, so just to make it a little more obvious what's going on. And then we have eval of tum prime and or eval tum prime prime. And of course, we need to say then and else because that's proper interest syntax. And the parentheses are also unnecessary. We could all fit on one line here. Now, you said Idris is strict, so this may not. Or the if is lazy. Okay. Idris's own if is lazy. Okay. Um, and, and so you have optional laziness available, just like Haskell has optional strictness available. Okay. But the default is indeed to be strict. Okay, so in order to do an application, what do we do? Evaluate TM and TM prime and then apply them in Idris. Exactly. We just reuse Idris's own function application here. So we can say that it's eval TM. Actually, I'm going to call them F and X here just because it makes it a little more nice to read. So we eval F in the environment and apply that to the evaluation of its argument in the environment. Great. What do we have on the right-hand side of this case? Lambda. Yeah, what kind of lambda? Idris lambda? Yeah, e exactly. OK, people are following along. Just want to make sure. <laughs> OK, so we, we have some x. We have a function which takes some argument x. And then uh, I'll give a meta variable here. So the right-hand side now that we need we can see that we have an x, which is whatever the type of t is, and we need to return whatever the type of u is. And how do we how do we do this? Well, we look at and we see that tum, the the body of the function, in an environment extended with t, gives me back a u. Right. So and and we know how to extend our context. We know how to return, extend our runtime environment env with a new value, which is the argument to our function. So we can put those ingredients together and reuse eval. So that becomes eval tm in x colon colon n. Right, so we just push it onto the stack and then evaluate the body. And then finally, in order to do a variable, we say lookup i n. And now we have an interpreter. So now we can go to the REPL and say eval uh, not t. What? <laughs> right. In the empty environment. And we get back false, as we'd expect. We can say, you know, eval. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna type and choose. You can trust me that it works. That'll take that long. OK. So that was the well-typed interpreter. Next, I'd like to take a little break and then sort of switch over into a little bit of research talk mode. So it'll be much less me sitting and typing and much more sort of me waving my arms excitedly. <laughs> so F sharp, the, which is this functional language for .NET, for those who don't know about it, I'm sure you all do, actually. But uh, it has this feature called uh, type providers, which is really, really cool. So here's a screenshot from Visual Studio. And what you can see is that there's this type O data service, but, but it's being applied to a string, right? Th this, should, this should puzzle you a little bit, because we've been talking about dependent types all evening, which is where you can you know, actually apply types to values, but, but F Sharp doesn't have dependent types. Uh, what, what's going on? Well, what's going on here? is that it's triggering the type checker to load this DLL and generate a bunch of stuff behind the scenes 
in a, such that you can sort of get autocomplete that's going out to this website and downloading the schema of, it, of its data source, generating types from that schema, and generating code to access data that matches the schema. So you're getting like this completion and t static checking and everything of an external data source that you yourself have not defined. This is really, really cool, right? But it, it, it's a bit like a sausage. I mean, as delicious as it may seem, the insides are a little bit gross. Like, there's always like DLL, <laughs> and, 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 like code generation, and like, what, what's going on here, right? <laughs> so, it, it, it's got some issues, right? Like, you're breaking the fundamental abstractions of your programming language every time you do code generation. Um, you might even generate like ill type terms. You might generate malformed types. I mean, you could generate a, a, a class that inherits from itself using this feature. And it'll get caught later on in the process. I mean, you're not going to get any code, but you're not going to get any sort of incorrect code out of it. But the author of the type provider themselves needs to take into account all these sort of complicated issues, which you just don't have when you're working within the abstractions of your type system and your programming language. Um, and type providers also need to develop in a separate module because you know the type providers need to be a DLL, which is loaded by the type checker, and so it can't sort of be in the same module that you're currently trying to compile because you need to be compiled already and there'd be this chicken egg kind of thing. So you know, I was looking at it and I thought, this is this is really cool stuff, these type providers. Uh, but I've been hacking on Idris for a little while and I think, well, well what happened if, you know, how how can we pull this into Idris? Can we can we do better given that we have a more expressive type system? So the, the key insight sort of came out to me, well, types they're 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 terms like any other type, right? I mean, they're terms like any other term, because we have dependent types. We have sort of one language to do everything. And so we have a way of producing new terms from I.O. behavior, which is what these type providers essentially are doing. Right? That's just execution. We run a program. Yeah? So here's, here's a simple example of interest type providers in action. Very simple. So we have a, this function from file, which takes a string, which is a file name, and it's returning I.O. of provider of type. So I.O. is just a Haskell-style I.O. monad, and provider is something that looks an awful lot like either string. In other words, it's, it's sort of a simple error type. The reason I'm not using that is because I'm in the process of extending it with a, a couple of extra constructors. And then it's a type that's being provided. So from file of some file name, it simply begins by reading the contents of the string identified by the file name, and putting that in the variable string, and then well, it, it tries to trim the string. So trim is just a function that removes leading and trailing white space. And if the string modulo white space is equal to the string int, then it returns the type int. Otherwise, it returns the type net. And then it sort of packs type up in this constructor provide, which is kind of like write. Then uh, we say percent provide. So things we need with percent are like you know, compiler uh, pragmas saying do something special. and so we're providing the variable t1, which is type type, which is a t1 is a type. And then we're calling this function from file on the string the type. And so when the type checker hits this line, what it's going to do is it's going to execute this IO action and then unpack the resulting type and then stick it in as the definition of t1. And then finally, we say that foo is a t1. And because 3 is valid syntax for an int or an at, this will type check either way. But if we go and change the contents of that text file sitting next to my program, the text file called the type to be the string int or the string nat or some other string, the type inside of my program will also change. So um, if we're going to do this, we want a way of providing error messages. And so th that's why we have this type provider rather than having the IO of type. So I can sort of return an error of some string. Later on, I'm also going to be able to do postulates and all sorts of cool stuff, but it's not quite there yet. Actually, postulates I just committed, but I should probably update this slide. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, errors, right? So confirm age is going to be a function that's er, rather an I/O action that uh, is a, that results in a boolean. Um, and what it does is it asks the user, "How old are you?" It then reads whatever they type. It attempts to parse that as an integer. If it fails to parse it, then it says, I didn't understand you, and calls itself again. This blatantly does not pass a totality checker. Um, otherwise, it returns whether or not the number that it successfully parsed 
is greater than or equal to 18. Okay? So this isn't a type provider. This is just a totally normal I.O. action. But we can stick it into this uh, type provider by uh, first off confirming the age, and if it's old enough, then we print out to the console OK, and then we provide true. Uh, the only reason I'm not providing unit here is just because it's syntactically less convenient. Um, and then otherwise, we return the error, only adults may compile this program. Okay? And, and then this line here, provide OK, call Boo with adults only, means when, when, the, when the type checker gets there, it'll stop. It'll print out, how old are you? You type in a number, and it may ask you again if it didn't understand you. And, or <laughs> it'll continue compiling and say OK, or it'll fail and say only adults may compile. So you have to hope that your users are honest. Otherwise, this is very bad security. <laughs> but it, it, it's kind of a silly example, but it's meant to sort of just be illustrative that arbitrary I.O. actions are happening, and we're getting out types. So now, a quick little demo of a slightly less silly example. I should have had this rigged up and ready to go. Thinking about it, it seems a, it seems a lot like list macros. I, like, like you've kind of brought list macros into the... I don't think it does, because this isn't changing syntax into syntax. I mean, this, okay. is, this is running a program and then splicing the results into the of whatever that program returned into the program being compiled. To me, it seems a whole lot like unsafe perform I.O. It is, just in the type system. Right. Right, because... Yeah, so I actually got to, yeah, to... Right, because if you want to yeah. do unification, you need sure. to find out what a type is. So, right, it could call, like, the unsafe perform I.O. Right. to evaluate... Yeah, so it's, it's actually... Right. Uh, you, a, way, a way to see it is a slightly safer unsafe perform I.O., right? Right. Because it can only occur at the top level rather than embedded down in arbitrary expressions. Right, so it's only where, it's high, where it's I only have a, that percent provide thing. Part, is, yeah. It's only allowed at the top level. But otherwise, yeah, totally. Um, the this, I actually got started on this thing by like when I was sort of first learning Idris typing an unsafe perform IO in, inside of a type and, and wondering why it didn't work. <laughs> and yeah, so then I kind of made it work in some sense. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Anyways, so um, here's uh, an example of the kind of things you can do with Idris type providers. So we have uh, some, a bunch of imports at the top, um, then uh, you know some this link and include and lib stuff is just a way of saying that the resulting code should be linked with some C libraries, um, and then I provide this variable db inside of which has type database of text.sqlite by calling run of get schemas from test.sqlite. Okay, so the file test.sqlite um, is so if I sort of print the schemas of the tables inside the database, I get you know create table of test foo int not null bar text. Um, create table of people, which has which is a, a column called name, which is a non-null text, and a column called age, which is a nullable int, and has transport, which has an owner, which is a name, which is sort of a pointing in name. I'm not claiming this is good database design in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to normalize it a little bit, but yeah. And it's got a description, which is a non-nullable text, and it's got a number of wheels. Yeah. So. So if I want to say like what's what's in the test, well, it's got you know two, foo, three, three, and forty-three, and then the empty text. Um, yeah, if I want to see what what what's in people, we've got me and Cthulhu. I guess he doesn't really have an age, <laughs> uh, and then transport. We can see that you know I've got a bike with two wheels and Cthulhu's wings have no wheels. Okay, so that's what's in my database. So returning to my Emacs buffer, I didn't like it. Oh, I have some leftover bike code. I need to delete. Sorry. Okay. 
while that does its thing. Okay. So the, the kind of thing that I want to do with this type provider is I want to be able to do queries against the database with a nice syntax where the schema is statically checked. So, so we have foos, which are just going to extract this column foo from the database. And that's going to be an integer. So this is sort of the schema of the result of the query up here. And we sort of select the integer foo from the table test, where the column foo is equal to the column foo. That's sort of a trivially true condition. Uh, let's see if that's done yet. Yes. It's like the ultimate integration test here, type checking the database. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's the same kind of thing you can do with <laughs> F sharp type providers. Okay. Oh. I didn't load it. Right. Now it's happy. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So then we have uh, people, which is doing a query of the people database, extracting the names. Um, it's doing the, the same kind of thing. Um, note that I've got one here instead of bool because SQLite doesn't have a reasonable representation of booleans. So I'm just using ints like they do. And then transit is perhaps a little bit more interesting, where what we want to do is a join based on the name between the person and the transit. And this query language is somewhat anemic, so we don't have like natural join built in. So we just take the Cartesian product down here and then check that the column name is equal to the column owner. Okay. And then we have a little bit of functions here that take a query and print out the result. And then we have a main function which is going to print the result of all three queries. So if we get over here, we can then have a So colon exec at the redevelop print loop compiles our program and runs it. So we can see that it gave us back the same answer that we would expect based on what we were seeing earlier inside of SQLite. OK. So it, so it works once I get rid of sort of stale object code files that I generated yesterday and it becomes stale already. OK. Um, so that select from where is that one of those Idris custom syntax. Yeah, thing. so that's more like a little bit more like a Lisp macro, but it's much more limited in what it can do. Uh, I'll show you the definition of it in a little bit. Okay. So one thing I might want to do here is sort of check that my column names down here match my column names up there. So if I had an extra O there, <coughs> and then I sort of ask it to load it, I get this sort of ridiculous error message, which means something like it went wrong. But indeed, <laughs> indeed, I know that it went wrong. OK. Um, so that, that's one type of thing that can go wrong. Another thing, that, well, what if, what if I add the extra O in both places? Perhaps someone renamed the table on my database, right? I try to load it, and well, uh, it still went wrong. Does this point you like where you should look, or is it not able to um, quite give you that information? It, it points me at the top level definition in question right okay. now. So not as, as good as it should Okay. yet. Does it go into the database to determine the error, or is it based on the, the where clause? So in this case, it did it based on the where clause, oh. because it didn't need to go to the database. Um, but in this case, it, after I rename it everywhere, now it went to the database and checked. Hmm. And indeed, if I go to my REPL and I type in DB, then I actually see a, rep, a reflection of the schema of the database. Because right, when I loaded the file, it went out and opened the database, parsed the schema, and then spliced it in as this data type, which is a code in the universe of SQL, um, of SQL types, right? using that universe trick that we saw earlier. Right. That's why it's red, being a data type, right? Hmm. OK. OK. 
likewise, um, let's say I had some overlapping uh, some overlapping columns. That would be a problem as well, right? Because then when I tried to select a particular column out inside of an expression, it wouldn't know which one to use. So let's say I wanted to say uh, lots of people, and that's going to be a query in DB, and it's going to be names. But then I'm going to say that lots of people are going to be select name text from people times people where one. And now I try to load it and I get this error message because the column names of, uh, of people and people are not disjoint. And you can kind of see that up here, like it's saying I can't figure out that they're disjoint. Um, okay, great. We indeed want it to force a rename of one of the things first. Okay. So we're able to do queries on our database and statically check that they make sense. What about the duplication of the types or the type to the values where you have like you have to state the query, like all the things you're using, and then come back and say it again in the select? Like is that necessary or let's check. <laughs> yeah, it was oh. here. Uh, maybe I can get away with not writing it here. <laughs> That worked. Huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so oftentimes you can, you can put underscore and that means Idris solved this by unification. Okay. In that case it could. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, the way it works, just as you saw before, we have, uh, we, we're using this universe trick. So we have the type SQLite type, which is codes for individual column types. We have text, integer, and real, and then we have nullable of some other column type. Nothing here is stopping me from writing nullable of nullable of nullable of nullable of int, um, except for the fact that my parser code will never generate one, and I'm okay with that. I could work harder <laughs> to represent it another way. Um, like, for example, as a pair of one of these simple ones in a bool saying whether it's nullable, that would be another representation that would also work fine. And then we have an interpretation function, which maps you know text to string, integer to integer, real to float, and then nullable of x to maybe of the interpretation of x. Then this colon, colon, colon is simply a, a fancy pair type with the type parameters fixed, right? So we have this infix operator colon, 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 which takes a string representing a column name and a SQLite type representing a particular type. Then a schema inside of this database, uh, which is what you're seeing up inside of the queries, is either nil or it's an attribute const onto a schema. And because we're using Idris's overloading here, we can use that list-like syntax for them. I could have also have written it's a list of pair of string and SQLite type, and that would have been fine. It would just make the type errors a little bit more difficult to read. Okay. Then a row is indexed by a schema, so it looks very much like the environments that you saw earlier with the simply typed lambda calculus interpreter. So we have the nil is a is a row in the empty schema, and then a cons is an interpretation of some type t, and a row in s, and that is a row in an attribute called call with type t const onto s. So the only difference between this and the env that you saw earlier in the Lambda Calculus interpreter is this call colon colon colon, and then a couple of things we named. So you've seen it before. Okay. The db, this is the thing that the type provider itself is generating, is indexed by a string. So the string inside the type is just holding the file name of the database. And that is intended to allow you to open up multiple databases and keep track that the queries are against the correct database. Then, the, so the constructor for this data type takes the file name, which it just moves up into the type, and then it takes a list of pairs of string and schema, which is the table name and then the schema for the table. Finally, we have a representation of queries. Now, this is a somewhat complicated looking data type, I guess. As one constructor called select, 
Um, the curly braces here are allowing you to give an, an implicit argument explicitly. Right? So if I just wrote db, it wouldn't be able to figure it out. So here I can say what the type should be. I could have also used a using block. Then it gives me back, uh, or yeah. So then I, I give it uh, tables, which is just say a collection of tables uh, inside of that database. Um, you haven't seen the definition for it, but it's just looking up the names of the tables inside the database to see that they're actually there. Um, then it takes an expression, so this is the where part, and it has to be one returning integer because I'm dealing with SQLite where bools are just integers. Then it takes some result schema that I'm looking for, and then it takes some proof that that subschema, or that, that S primes is a subschema of S, where S is the type that I got from taking the Cartesian product of all the tables that I care about. And then I have this auto solve it thing. And what that's doing is it's causing the compiler to go out and figure out what OK was so that I didn't need to type it in as a user. So this is just a little bit of automation there to make it convenient. And then finally, I have a query inside of the smaller schema. Any questions? This is a little bit of a, a mouthful here. But it's using all the, it's, it's just using the ingredients that you've seen so far, plus one new little thing, which is this proof search. What you don't really need to worry about right now, just realize that it happens. And then the details of it is something that, is something that you can pick up after you've hacked a little bit of interest for a while, should you come to do that. Okay. So, but essentially all, all of the, the type correctness stuff is living here. Then I can simply define a little tiny syntax extension. I say the select of some expression schema from some expression tables, where some expression expert, and then I just pass those as arguments to this <laughs> constructor. It was a very sort of thin layer on top of the constructor. And that's what got me that query language. Okay. So what that type provider does is it then goes out, you know, it does the exact same query you saw me type in. You know, select SQL from SQLite underscore master, and then it parses each of the return schemas and in, in this sort of data description language, and then finally it returns an instance of DB, where if you remember, DB was this data type right here. And that sort of gets spliced into the resulting module, so I can statically check my schemas. Okay, so the way this works behind the scenes, um, the Idris compiler works really in sort of three phases, or three main areas. You have some uh, desugared representation of edges where sort of do notations have been replaced by bind, and uh, idiom brackets have been replaced by you know pure and apply, um, that kind of thing. And that goes through this, co this process called elaboration, which is translating all of this implicit convenient things to fully explicit, fully annotated, you know, type annotations all over the place, core type theory, which is just called TT for type theory. But it also looks kind of like a pi, which, and pi types are the name of the dependent <laughs> functions traditionally. So we kind of sort of retconned that on. <laughs> and then that goes through a bunch of optimizations, and then C code is generated, and then Idris is done with it. Okay. So in other words, if we want to add a feature to Idris, then if we can't do it by a straightforward desugaring, then we have to do it by saying, like explaining how we go from that feature of the language to the core type theory. So the way that we elaborate provide x colon t with p, well, first we elaborate our goal type t, that is this type, to some tt type tau. And we have an elaborator, so we can just use that. Uh, and then we check that it's a type. And it can either be type, which is the type of types, or it can be a specific type, which might be something like db of test.sqlite. You know, if, if it's like if we put seven here, it wouldn't make any sense. So that's why we have this check. The next step is then to elaborate this provider term after with to some tt t uh, term pi, and then we check that pi has type io of provider of tau, because if it doesn't, then it wouldn't make any sense to use it as a type provider. Finally, we then execute pi using the ordinary execution semantics of Idris. Um, this is that unsafe perform IO you were asking about. And if the result is provide of Y, then the result, then sort of the elaborated result of the entire top level thing is the type declaration X colon tau, and then the definition X equals Y. 
Otherwise, if it's the constructor error containing some error message error, then we show the user this error message and say, you know, this the type provider didn't work for this reason. So in this case, it might be something like I didn't understand the schema of the database. And then if we got back something else, then it means something went horribly wrong, and then we just say generic error message. So this is all only available at compile time, right? So once exactly. you compile down, then if the database changes underneath you, you have to recompile the program and if you want those it. guarantees. Okay. So you know, if they add another column, you're probably okay, right? <laughs> but yeah. Oh, so it won't even error out if they change the, the database. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you could make it do that if you wanted okay. by, for example, having the type provider also stick a hash of the schema into your program, and then having the query function check that hash. Right. Um, but many times, like a little schema change is going to be backwards compatible to old clients anyway, so it's probably okay. In any case, I didn't think it was something that should be built into the feature, and F# -sharp type provider will work exactly the same way. Okay. And they actually have some nice things where the types at compile time get erased to simpler types in the resulting code, which can also make it a little bit more robust for schema changes. But it's 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 quite a complicated and difficult matter, and it's going to depend very much on the specifics of what you're doing. Okay. So in order to make this work, we needed something called an executor, right? Because we couldn't use the normal evaluator of the programming language. Like, so the, the evaluator is what happens during type checking when you need to reduce an expression, and it's what happens at the redevelop print loop when you tell it to evaluate an expression. But the evaluator semantics aren't exactly the runtime semantics of the program. So first off, the evaluator doesn't know how to do unsafe or form IO. Because the evaluator is part of the type checker, because we have dependent types, we want, really want to be able to trust it, which means it's not written in the IO method in the implementation of Idris. Instead, it's, uh, you know, it's a completely pure function. So we want to be able to do that. Um, also, it's, uh, it needs to be sort of very careful about strictness. Uh, the evaluator can be kind of fast and loose, because usually it's working with total functions. Um, it's working with open terms. It might hit a variable and then not be able to evaluate any further, those kind of things. Whereas the executor, it matters very, very much in the case of, like, say, the infinite loop we saw earlier with the confirm age function, because the evaluator might run forever because it would sort of try to infinitely expand the term, and that's perfectly fine for evaluation purposes, but for execution, we really need to sequence all of the actions in the right order and those kind of things. So it's different design in, uh, considerations here. So one part of implementing type providers like an Idris is that you need to have an executor. So I think that this approach has some nice advantages compared to like F-sharp type providers. So the, the big one is that it maintains all of the abstractions and all of the safety properties of Idris. The Idris's type system guarantees that your type provider itself is type safe because it's just a normal program, so that works fine. When you're doing code generation, you don't have those guarantees. Um, another advantage is that you can use ordinary programs as type providers and you can develop type providers as ordinary programs. You don't need to do anything special to make them work. And you can just sit there in your redevelop print loop, you can run little bits of them, you can extract parts of your program and turn them into a type provider if you realize, hey, this would be useful, as opposed to having to rewrite it entirely to do code generation. And finally, as we saw, we can define and use a type provider in one module by just defining it and then using it on the next line, which is nice for a quick little one-off. Uh, it's got some big problems compared to F-sharp type providers. I'm not trying to claim that this is sort of kicking its butt, because it's very much not. So one is that we can't introduce new identifiers, and this is inconvenient. You saw all those table names as strings, but that, that's kind of ugly. I mean, we can check that the string is found, but I'd like to use identifiers as identifiers. But that would mean that we lost this sort of nice elaboration story. Um, also, we don't have laziness support, really. So one really cool feature of F-sharp type providers, also as compared to something like template Haskell, is that they allow you to be very careful about when the I.O. actions that are part of the type provider are performed. So if you're working with a very large schema, you can sort of parse it on demand and generate code on demand and sort of work with it in a very exploratory fashion. Um, and supporting that inside of Idris would require pulling the main type checker into the I.O. monad so that it can force bugs coming out of the executor. That is something we haven't wanted to do so far. Another big issue is that record types have to be kind of faked. Like you saw with that row type earlier, you 
it would be nice to be able to just sort of generate a real record type, but we just can't do that due to the way that record types work. So we have to, you know, we, we can fake it, but it's not as nice. And then finally, the error messages are kind of terrible, but I'm working on that, actually. Okay. So the next steps, I mean, I want to do lazy type providers. I'll figure out a way one of these days. Um, I, I'd like to, I think a good use case for this is FFI generation. So it would be, I, I was talking, I forget who I was talking to, but there was someone who was really interested in using this to parse the type declaration files that TypeScript uses for JavaScript libraries and then get interest types for use with the JavaScript FFI on the JavaScript backend. That'd be really nice. Then you don't have to type them all in yourself. And then um, I'd also like to make it work at other times. So right now they work during type checking. It'd be cool if you could take the same action and, and then use a different compiler annotation to have it be something that runs at uh, program startup time. It's like a, a, a moderately common Haskell idiom is to have an unsafe perform I.O. on the right-hand side on, of a top-level definition in order to sort of, at runtime, do some complicated I.O. thing and generate something which will be constant forever. Um, so for example, you might make something that when a program starts, it checks what locale it was started in and then has that available forever. <clears throat> and obviously, the locale of the machine it's running on may not be the same as the locale of the machine that it was type-checked on. So you couldn't use a type provider. If you want to read more about it, I got a I had a paper at WGP last year, which you can read, uh, or you can read my master's thesis from last year, which is uh, available on my website. And that's also got the best Idris tutorial I could write in chapter four. So it, it's kind of opinionated and strange, but maybe it'll work. <laughs> okay, so drop the sausage, eat the kale. <laughs> yeah. All right, so. That wraps up the things I wanted to present. There's a lot of things I didn't get to. So type classes, there was a question about that earlier. Um, they, they can do some strange things in Idris, so it, I, I didn't get into it, but uh, okay. um, Edwin's got this effects library, which is really, really cool. Um, it's as a replacement for Monad transformers. It's a, sort of a DSL for writing effects where you can combine them in different directions and you don't have to write lifts all the time and that kind of thing. Indian brackets and bang bindings are two sort of nice syntactic conveniences for dealing with applicative functors and monads, which are nice. Uh, proof automation, I, I you only saw a little tiny bit of. There's quite a lot of potential for that in Idris. Um, I didn't get into that. Um, optional laziness, I didn't get into. Um, so you can do lazy computation if you want, and that, that's how if is implemented. I just didn't show you how. It's in the tutorial. And then finally, codata and co-recursion give you Haskell-style data types where they can be potentially infinite and you sort of produce them on demand. And I didn't get into that either, but it's there if you want it. Uh, further resources include uh, the main Idris website at uh, idrislang.org. There's a mailing list which is on Google Groups, which is just called Idrislang. Uh, probably the best place to go and the most active place where we actually collaborate and communicate in the project is the Idris channel on Freenode. Um, we tend to be pretty friendly to noobs. Then there's the wiki on uh, the Idris GitHub page. And so that's got like an in-progress user manual as well as some installation help. So there's there's a few dependencies that are difficult for people who aren't running Linux, because that's just how things are for in the Haskell world sometimes. And so we've tried to do our best to assemble documentation about how to get everything up and running on you know, Windows and Mac OS and all these other OSs. And then we've got a GitHub group called Idris Hackers, where we are a little bit more fast and loose than with the main project. And you know, if you want commit rights there, you just get them. And <laughs> there we have things like the, the Vim and the Emacs modes. We have like various libraries, like a parser combinator library. And then like there's an IRC bot, for example, which you can see that sits on the IRC channel and evaluates stuff for you. And, that lives there too if you want to work on it. Um, if you want to get involved, if, if you thought this seemed like fun and you want to come and learn Idris, a great way to do it is just to start hacking. You don't have to be like a dependent types wizard to do useful things on the compiler. Um, my first project, what got me into it when I didn't know anything about dependent types at all, I was trying to learn them using Idris, so I just added tab completion to the REPL because I thought it was so irritating having to take it. So, and, and there's lots of that low hanging fruit still. Um, it's, it's a very young project. We're not that many people working on it, so. You can do good if you just know a little bit of Haskell. And we don't use crazy Haskell either. It's mostly simple stuff. I think the craziest extension we use is like um, pattern guards. So, um, 
you can also write some documentation. We really need documentation. Um, there, you can port your favorite library from Haskell. Just remember that it's a strict language when you're doing so. Uh, we need a lot of polish. So if, if you just go through and, and sort of find stupid error messages and document them and create issues, um, those of us who've been using the language for a while now have sort of realized this crazy error means this and we don't notice it anymore. So like the, the perspective of a beginner is really valuable as a contribution. You can just say this was difficult. Um, and, and also if you, if you want to sort of work on editor support, like if, if you like VimScript or Elisp or um, if, I know there's a lot of people using Sublime Text these days. If, if a Sublime Text mode would be awesome, uh, then I, I would totally help you out with understanding the machine readable interface to the REPL that the Emacs mode uses. So there's a, I know this is, this was more relevant when I was doing this talk in Copenhagen, but uh, <laughs> so we're having an interest developers meeting in Gothenburg <laughs> next month. Um, we'll but if, if, any of you have, if any of you want to sort of, you know, if you have family in Sweden, you want to visit. <laughs> so, boat, it, right? sorry? Just take a boat, right? I suppose, I'd, I'd probably fly. But, <laughs> uh, if I'm coming from Copenhagen, I take the bridge. <laughs> but uh, we have, uh, so on Tuesday, we have like a lot of introductory stuff for Agda and Haskell hackers, because there's lots of both at Chalmers. And then Wednesday to Friday, we talks, products, and, and bug squishing and getting stuff done. So if you want to come, send me an email, and there's details on the wiki on GitHub. Thank you very much for coming, and I appreciate your long attention. Questions obviously ask because I think yeah. people have been asking questions. So. And you can email me too if you're too fried in the head now. Yeah, just, <laughs> just